Jordan Peterson has become hugely successful. Um, what do you make of the, the phenomena? Why do you think he's become so successful now? There is a drought of authenticity and courage. And Peterson has found that hunger and he's tapped into it. And I, I admire his ability to detect it and to speak to it plainly in a way that it resonates with. I did, we were on a panel together in Vancouver and I watched his talk and he described his own surprise at how effective his message had, had been. And he basically said that if he had outlined his message as the core of a business model, that it would have looked laughable to him and that he was as shocked as anybody that people were resonating with it. But when, when you live in a world that is as full of crap as the world we live in, where people are advertising bullshit to you from the moment you get up to the moment you go to sleep, and then somebody finally tells you some truth that you need to hear, it's a relief. It's a relief just to know that there's some channel that isn't compromised by nonsense. And uh, he, I don't think he's the only one speaking truthfully, but I think he is speaking from the heart and people know it. I think that he grasps directly the fact that human beings can only actually make sense of the world by virtue of communication with other human beings. And this is all about the notion of admixture, uh, that one must have a mixture of, of, well, I mean, he uses the mythopoetic to make sense, the order, order and chaos. Uh, the way, right, the Taoist way is the alchemical admixture of order and chaos. Uh, and that's it. Like, that's how you do it. And so if you bias towards orderliness, uh, you find yourself in a rigid, non-adaptive, uh, non-creative, non-exploratory framework, um, which will die because the world changes. If you bias towards chaos, um, you, you eat your young and evaporate, um, which also dies for obvious reasons. Uh, and the key is to actually enable these things to be in relationship with each other, in vital, healthy relationship with each other. And I think that's, in some sense, the essence of what he's mm -hmm. focusing on and is sort of the core of what he's actually about. He's very easy to work with as his voice is an instrument because he speaks very deliberately and sonorously and rhythmically anyway. He actually speaks in, in a kind of form of rhythmic poetry. Sometimes he is actually rapid. Peterson's words plus lo-fi hip-hop equals JBP Wave. At first it's like, oh, it's a novelty thing, and then I kind of listen to it and it's like, no, it's not a novelty thing, this is actually really good. <laughs> yeah, that's been, that's been the reaction all over. I think that, that was Peterson's reaction. Right. He was instantly like, thought this was going to be silly and was amused, and then was like, oh, this is actually artful. And oh, now it's actually proving useful. And uh, that's generally the reaction from people. And if you don't have a noble aim, that's not good. That's not good. That, that's not good. You have nothing but shallow. Interesting that you say as well that Peterson has a very musical or a very um, performative aspect to, to his speech because he talks about perform performance or aligning yourself with the truth. Mm -hmm. And if you're aligning yourself with the logos of the creative principle, mm -hmm. you would expect to be for that to have an effect on your actual performance. Yeah. Like he feels like a very embodied speaker when he's on stage, like he's fully inhabiting the Those stories are, that yeah. he's that he's telling. And that that performative aspect of it is seems to me at least also related to what he's talking about, the logos and in, incarnating it more in your life and incarnating it more in your in your being. Yes. And watching him become that over the years, because he was not always as, as confident and uh, able to just... Now, you know he freestyles, right? Mm. He, he's, he's, his whole he's career... Yeah. yeah, his whole career has really reminded me of... It's very... 50 Cent, for example, got big uh, off the back of uh, drama. There was created drama, you know, beefs with other rappers and being shot 13 times and all this stuff, which draws people into the story. But then he had this huge body of work and that kept people there. Peterson did this. Peterson 
had these public dramas and that brought people to him, but then when they got to him, they, there was this huge body of work for them to get sort of lost and immersed in. And Peterson has some kind of drama like every week at this point. He's like the ultimate sort of contemporary battle rapper. He's at war with all sorts of people at all times. And it's, it's brilliant, very interesting. And if you're into, you know, if you're a rap fan or if you're a, what would you call, if you're a intellectual dark web or whatever the hell it is fan, it's like this guy's getting incredible beefs every week, right? And there's a new sort of super villain to root against every week with regards to him or if you're on his side or not, you know, it's, the whole thing's very entertaining, but then it pulls you in and then there's all this meaning and this huge body of, of work. Meaning is what you have to buttress yourself against the tragedy of life. Despite the fact that you're a fragile, damaged, mortal creature. But he's quite new on this, like if you watch him like 15 years ago, he was a bit awkward and sort of, he was very charming and he knew what he was talking about. But the absolute fucking beast that he has become as a performance creature who can now just rock up at an amphitheater and just like freestyle a new two hour lecture off the top of his head. And he's very into not repeating himself too much. And it's like, you go see a stand-up comedian, you'll see pretty much the same set every week for like a year or something, right? He won't do that. Uh, he's more like a very good DJ. Yeah. Like, you know, he has all these, he has like a fistful of things that, you know, his works together and they're linked and he can take you on these different journeys. But depending on who's in the room and where he is, he will create a new and transformative always experience. Where, it, where is his insight coming from? And so we talked, you know, you, when you were describing, hey, you almost sound a little bit like Jordan Peterson. I mean, in the sense of, yeah, I, I mean, if I had to describe my worldview in a nutshell, it would be sort of a neoplatonic so there was a you know, neoplatonic stoic um, mystic christic gnostic <laughs> so the idea of neoplatonic i believe i have always just sort of felt like there is a a realm of ideal forms mm. stoic do the suck it up fat kid and do the hard thing 100 percent um gnostic there is a certain ineffable experience of being and then the mystic christic is some some reflection on the Judeo-Christian Western tradition, but n nothing to do with 2,000 years of bureaucratic administration and everything to do with what is nominally the metaphor of Kairos and Kronos, the intersection of kind of sacred and, and profane time in human form. Mm. Um, so in that respect, yeah, um, I would track with, with Peterson. My sense is for me, um, my you know, gnosis or understanding um, has come from ecstasis, has come from um, peak experiences. Um, and my sense for him, at least as he shares what he does of his life, has come from catharsis, it's come from the suffering, it's come from um, battling depression, it's come from staring the abyss in the face versus the view from the summit. And those are ideally come full circle and reinforce each other. But if I had to sort of delineate maybe where is his transmission anchoring from, it's maybe a little bit more the staring the abyss and, and, and surviving it than, uh, than calling out coordinates from the mountaintop. The most important thing for me, quite apart from his work with you know, these stories, of modern myths, was, as you say, his investigation into the Bible. And I've always been fascinated, although I'm an atheist, I've always been fascinated by the power of the biblical stories. I often found myself looking at these huge cathedrals and churches that sprouted up all over Europe, you know, and, uh, and, and I asked myself, well, what's that about? You know, why was this story so powerful? I mean, yeah, it's a defence against death if you want to be cynical, but hey, you know, it could be lots of other stories, you know, and why, why is this one so unbelievably powerful? And what does it mean for it to be so powerful? And Peterson, I think, brilliantly answers that question in the biblical lectures he's done and he really changed me those lectures he genuinely did I think change the way I lived my life because he came to this very very important conclusion which I'm pretty convinced by I don't think I'm ever 100% convinced by anything but I'm very convinced by his idea as I've, I've I'm someone who suffered depression and depression is like a crisis of meaning in your, in your and it's the worst thing about depression is not about being miserable, it's being having a life that seems utterly meaningless and, and that's why it's such torment. And Peterson in a way tries to answer the question, how do we as an individual, that's a bit of a paradox, how do I as an individual acquire meaning? Because meaning is the most important thing any of us could have. 
you know, there's meaning is it, you know, if you don't, and yet no one can quite say what meaning is, which I think is interesting in itself. You know, everyone says, well, I want a sense of meaning. Well, what is a sense of meaning? What is meaning? And Peterson, I think, acknowledges that mystery, but also says, well, you know, if you want a sense of meaning, it's not about just doing what you want. It's not about just following your bliss, as Joseph Campbell would be, or, or, or having as much fun as possible, or, or even necessarily being... Happy. No, absolutely, not, not necessarily being happy. It's, there are more important things than being happy, and, and I've also found that to be true in my life. When Adam and Matt invited me to do that podcast, we were all someone who, similar to the two of you, I believe, was starting to track Peterson, and not just Jordan Peterson and what he was saying, but also the ripples he was having in culture, the absolute phenomenon and explosion um, of attention that was happening around him in the media, and started kind of watching him, reading him with an open mind. My experience was an open mind, like, oh, I resonate with that. I love how he's bringing in Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell and archetypal dimensions to his thinking, like how he's kind of kicking the left a little bit and calling them on some of their problematic um, thinking. And then watching this kind of phenomenon from the left or the far left where people just with extraordinary levels of um, anger and fear and distrust and kind of the, the difference in that experience of my own and some of our experiences of Peterson and then watching a lot of friends who are on the far left having radically different experience and perception of who he is and what he's bringing and was really just curious about that. And it, it seems like similar to some of the stuff you've been doing with Rebel Wisdom. And as a, I mean, you're training as a psychologist we do a lot of work with, with psychology as well. When there's a huge reactivity to something, there's always something interesting going on behind it, and then it sort of makes you inquire. It's like, okay, what, is, what are people reacting to? Yes. Mm -hmm. Whether you love them or hate them, it's like equal proportion of intensity. And whenever that's there, it's what's kind of called a complex. Complex is a, is a psychological, and I think Jung would say it, like it can be a, autonomous, an autonomous complex. Is yeah. It's not part of the ego. It's so deep rooted, and it's my opinion. It's a collective complex. It it's is. in the collective unconscious. And it's like everyone on the right thinks everyone on the left is a Stalinist, and everyone everyone on the right thinks everyone everyone on the left thinks everyone on the right is um, a Nazi. And there's this polarization happening where people like like Peterson, who are trying to carve out, I would say, not non-political, but a kind of a position that's lateral to politics. That's more in the psychological domain to ask people to look at themselves as individuals, to question the extent to which they're projecting their shadow onto the other, which until we can resolve issues on that level, it's going to be very difficult to resolve these political disagreements. And so that's one of the main reasons that I've found myself so interested in what Peterson is saying. Mm -hmm. He's shifting the level of the conversation, or trying to at least. I was so excited to see Jordan Peterson erupt onto the stage, and I know you had particular part in that. There is a culture war that is in bright precedence. I mean, we are in the middle of a culture war. There's a polarization, and Jordan Peterson is standing in the middle as a lightning rod, taking all the projections from both sides. He clearly sees the postmodern ideology, and it is an ideology. It's a system of beliefs and values that will not lead us to the promised land. It is, it is problematic. It leads us into a swamp with no exit. It is not sustainable. He sees it very clearly. And in my opinion, he sees it from a modern perspective, very brilliant modern perspective. He's, he's, and he has a depth because of his understanding of Carl Jung and his own work in psychology, the field of psychology, that is deeper than most people. So people are drawn to that depth. He sees something much deeper 
than other people are seeing right now. We had had, we'd never met one another. Um, I knew actually very little about Jordan Peterson's written work. He knew pretty little about mine. And we were just told, sit down and shoot. And we had no idea where we were going. So he just started talking. So why the master in his emissary? And it just went from there. But what I felt was, here was you know, a super intelligent man who had wide-ranging interests in psychology, philosophy, and didn't rule out a spiritual angle to things. Um, and I, I don't think that I would, and, and in the film, I, in that clip, I think it probably comes out that there are aspects of what Jordan was saying that I was going, well, yes, but. So I don't entirely kind of, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not a, a, a Peter, Petersonian, but I do have huge respect for him. And we had a, a great conversation, and we're proposing to do um, more. What do you make of the sort of the criticisms? Because often he's described as a fraud or a charlatan in some of the, the media coverage. But when you watch the interview with yourself, I mean, that's, that's a very high-level conversation. The idea of him as a fraud or a charlatan just seems kind of well, bizarre. It's, it's outrageous. It's, um, it's disrespectful. It's dismissive. And it's entirely typical of blinkered liberalism. He, you, you can disagree with him about many things, and I would disagree with him about a number of things. But to say that is just to show how blinkered you are. He, he's clearly an extraordinary man, and I, I don't know, how dare they call him a charlatan? What does that mean? I think what strikes people is that he was relatively unknown and then he became known. But that's what life is, and it doesn't prove you're a charlatan. I mean, a lot of this sounds quite Jordan Peterson-esque. What's your attitude to Jordan Peterson? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm glad he's out there. Um, and I think there are, you know, I mean, I think at a minimum, there's sort of three different Jordan Petersons. You know, there's Jordan Peterson, the analyst and academic, which virtually nobody ever heard of. There's Jordan Peterson, the kind of contrarian public intellectual, which sort of, you know, kicked off in 2016. Um, and then there's sort of Jordan Peterson, sort of Rorschach blot, for the culture wars, of which both left and right wildly distort who he is, what he's saying, and what it and, and what it means for them, and so we get we get the the second and the third ones completely mixed. Although the first one, you know, University of Toronto and you know former Harvard professor is the one that gives the credibility and the weight to the other two dialogues. So in that respect. Um, I think as a, as a, what I imagine him to be as an actual man is a pretty high integrity principled person who likes to think for himself and likes to speak not just truth to power but, but also likes to um, remind his audience, whether it's students or, or broader than that, um, what, what, is, you know, what, is a, what is a life well, a good life well lived. Um, and now there, I think there are, there are problems in how in the age of sound bites and hundreds of hours of footage and tons of speaking and those kind of things that become problematic. And I'm not in any way convinced that if I sat down with him and said, hey, mate, what about this bit, that he would actually stand and defend them. But impressions I get would be that his, um, I think he sometimes over catastrophizes the slippery slope to Marxism uh, in the sense of that, that all the, you know, this way lies Stalinist death camps, therefore we cannot give one inch on, on um, concessions to progressive ideals or agendas. Although, having said that, I have also personally experienced the almost Chinese communist, like Tom Zing, struggle sessions of political correctness in, in the academy and in kind of left wing, you know, left coast um, ideas. So it's not that I don't see the peril, I do. I just think sometimes he uses the slippery slope argument maybe he, I think he pulls it out just sometimes a little early mm. is the bottom line without necessarily enough conditions to justify it he sometimes um, in my experience I think I remember him on Joe Rogan doing the life is nasty brutish and short the kind of Hobbesian it's always been this way therefore any efforts to try and recalibrate or rebalance the scales are fundamentally flawed delusional and by the way lead to the Stalinist death camps um, without any more nuanced socio-political critique of practices and policies. So for instance, concentration of wealth in the 1% and even the percent of the 1% um, has been directly traceable, in, at least in the US, over you know, ta tax, and, tax and corporate law, uh, various, various deliberate policies 
that are fundamentally different than the 70s and 80s and have now resulted in an incredible skewing and aggregation of wealth in the hands of the few. For him to skip over that and go to lobsters and serotonin feels like skipping some critical steps and also skipping some critical places of potential responsibility. Um, for me, his success signifies how much we're thirsting for this father energy in our culture. What do you make of Jordan Peterson? What do you make of the Jordan Peterson phenomena? Yeah, I think, first of all, I, I would not have predicted it. So I don't want to, I, I think maybe I'm often called, in, among, my, among my people who agree with me, I'm called a visionary, and, but I was not a visionary in, in foreseeing um, um, Jordan Peterson. Um, I think it's amazing that an intellectual um, that is a Jungian, who is, um, you know, who speaks in terms of often of metaphor and um, an allegory uh, that he has risen to such extraordinary um, success. And I think it is, a re it is in part a result of our enormous hunger. Uh, we, you know, we have, uh, we've attached to two extremely unlikely figures because of our hunger. The Donald Trump on the one hand and Jordan Peterson on the other, two ends of the extreme uh, in terms of um, somebody who's been willing to say, you know, fathers are important, families are important. And so Jordan and I found ourselves in, in a, an hour and a half dialogue um, in which I would give a, uh, you know, I would talk about fathers and roughhousing, and he would talk about um, some intellectual um, Piaget or uh, someone else who was, um, you know, who was in the literature um, uh, or in Disney movies or something else that related to that. And it was just a fascinating hour and a half, I, I think, because um, you know, I, I'm usually when I'm being interviewed, I don't learn a great deal, um, but I certainly learned. Uh, I, I, it was wonderful the way um, uh, we learned from each other. And you're, you're from Canada. Yeah. One of the, the, the biggest um, phenomenon of the last couple of years has been Jordan Peterson. Yeah. What have you made of, of him, his rise, and what it says about the culture that people are so thirsting for what he's talking about? Peterson, first of all, is very bright, extraordinarily articulate, and in some ways a compelling speaker. So he's, a, he's an attractive figure in some ways. When I read him, I sense a lot of suppressed rage in him. I, I, in fact, I think his voice is choking with rage a lot of the time. It's interesting because he talks about rage, that you have to deal with it. I don't think he understands just how angry he is. And, it's, and, and, and if you look at his websites, the comments are full of rage by his young acolytes. Now that's an energetic thing. That, that it's his energy that draws people as much as what he actually teaches. Secondly, he teaches repression. I mean, he, he very rightly takes an issue where somebody mandates a certain kind of language, and he very rightly and righteously says that I will not be dictated to about what language I'm going to use. Well, good for him. I'm all in favor of not mandating language on the one hand. On the other hand, he basically advocates repression. Uh, in his book, he talks about how an angry two-year-old child needs to be sit by themselves until they get over it. Rather than understanding why a child would be angry at age two, what frustrations they're having, and what human contact they need to help them move through that anger, he says repress the anger. So he's all about repressed anger, as far as I'm concerned. And it's very interesting how he talks about children. He talks about little varmints and little monsters and so on. I know that's meant to be humorous, but it's also a certain way of thinking of the young human child. So fundamentally, I see him as an agent of repression. He posing as an agent of libertarianism. Not to mention, he's got this being his bonnet about what he considers to be, seems to consider to be conspiracies by left-wing intellectuals. They seem to be his bet noir. Uh, being a left-wing intellectual myself, uh, I like to talk to him sometimes. What, what are you so upset about, Jordan? What are you so afraid of? You know, he talks about these bloody Marxists, and, 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 he, and he points out very accurately all the horror that occurred under so-called Marxist regimes, particularly in the Soviet Union. He's absolutely accurate about that. But then he promotes Christianity. Shall I tell him about the mass murders that occurred in the name of Christianity? 
Should I tell them about all the millions that were slaughtered in the names of the gentle Jesus? In other words, let's be fair about it. Uh, he seems to pick ideologies to attack and abhor and embrace other ideologies that are just as murderous in practice sometimes. It's a much more interesting question for me. What happened in Eastern Europe? How come under an ideology that was meant to liberate people, so many people were oppressed? I come from Eastern Europe. I was born in Hungary. He doesn't have to tell me about what it was like. But how about asking, how come uh, a religious philosophy that was meant to promote love and acceptance and compassion has become such an agent of two millennia of repression, oppression, and, 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 and killing. So can we be objective, or we're going to be simply tribal about it? I have a lot to say to Jordan, or a lot to, as much as I appreciate, actually, some of what he says. And as interesting as I find him, I think he's a very mixed figure, largely an agent of, of repression. <laughs>